I heard an old, old story How a Savior came from glory How he gave his life on Calvary To save a wretch like me I heard about his groaning Of his precious blood atoning Then I repented of my sins And won the victory Oh, victory in Jesus My Savior
Hello, and on behalf of the leaders of the Westport Christian Church, I want to welcome you and thank you for joining us today as we worship our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Before we begin, can we please pray? Father God, I come before you and I thank you so much for this day. I thank you for this opportunity to get into your word, and I, I, I do humbly ask that you hide me behind your word, that you become greater, that you are seen in what we share today that your church has ears to hear, that we are equipped and we are edified, built up to go and to share the gospel good news of Jesus with everyone for their good and for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so last week we, we finished chapter two of Rev Revelation in, in this sermon series we're doing on the seven churches of Revelation. And chapter 2 covers four of those churches. Those are Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, and Thyatira. Now, I want to say that Revelation as a whole, the, the book when you take it together, was written for each of the seven churches that we're preaching on. And I take that from Revelation chapter 1, verses 10 and 11. And that's where John says this. He says, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice, like the sound of a trumpet, saying... Write in a book what you see and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus and to Smyrna and to Pergamum and to Thyatira and to Sardis and to Philadelphia and to Laodicea. So what this means is that Revelation is what is called a circular letter. That is, that's a letter that's intended to be shared with a great number of people in different locations. And if you take the order that, that the cities are given in this, this book, and you look at a map, what you will see is a letter would first have been sent from Patmos, where, where John was, to Ephesus, and then gone north and made it all the way in a circle around to the last city of La Laodicea. But even though this was a letter for all the churches, each of these seven churches is specifically mentioned by Jesus and given a personal message. And all of these messages... Uh, Jesus uses their personal circumstances, the, the history and the problems in that city, to speak his truth into them. Jesus gave each of the churches the exact information that they needed to do what he wanted them to do, depending on what they were going through. So last week I also I shared with you that the letters to the seven churches all follow a pattern. This pattern includes having an address to a specific church, giving that church a picture of Jesus, doing a, a praise for the church, what he finds good about them. He then shared a problem he had with the church. And then he said, this is the punishment that will happen for those who are unrepentant. And he ends with a promise for those who, who overcome, for those who stay faithful or those who repent and then remain faithful. So each of those letters, they, they follow that general pattern and it helps us to look for that when we're reading these letters. But it's also important to know this, that not every church that's written about has each of those things. You see, like, like Jesus didn't specifically have a problem with the church of Smyrna, something they were doing wrong. And there are other churches where Jesus doesn't really have any, any praise for them. So keep that in mind as we address today's text. We're in chapter 3 of Revelation, beginning in verse 1. And he says, to the angel of the church in Sardis write, he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars says this, I know your deeds, that you have a name, that you are alive, but you are dead. Wake up and strengthen the things that remain, which were about to die. For I have not found your deeds completed in the sight of my God. So remember that you have what you have received and heard and keep it and repent. Therefore, if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what hour I will come to you. But you have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their garments, and, and they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He who overcomes will thus be clothed in white garments, and I will not erase his name from the book of life. And I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So we begin with an address to a specific church. He says to the angel of the church in Sardis write. 
Now, what we need to know is that Sardis was an ancient city that was in decline. But they, they had once been important, even in the Roman Empire. And, and actually, before this, going back to like the 13th or 12th century BC, Sardis was the, the capital of a kingdom called Lydia. And Sardis was set at this crossroads of a very important trade route. And because of that, the city was wealthy. All of the travel and all of the trade in the area brought with them this, this, this idea, this thought of easy money. Sardis was also the very first city in Asia Minor, Minor that minted its own coinage. And it's honestly where we get our modern idea of money from, them beginning to, to have money then. So because of Sardis' great wealth, it was known for a city for its luxury and its, and its softness. They also had a reputation for apathy and immorality. The people were hedonistic and they were decadent. And what this means is that they were devoted to a life of pleasure, of, of sensuality, of, of doing what felt good. They wanted to live their best life now. And, and if we asked how, uh, they were doing, how they were doing, they, they probably could have said this. They, they would have said that they were living the dream. They were focused on doing and having the things that, that made life enjoyable, that made life comfortable and easy. Also in Sardis, we know that there was a large temple that's dedicated, that was dedicated to the mother goddess named Sybil. And her worship included engaging in sexually immoral behaviors. Another interesting fact about Sardis that we need to know is that it was situated on this, the top of this high hill and the hill had very steep cliffs, which were great for natural defense. And because of this, the people believed that it was going to be impossible for an army to be able to scale up those steep cliffs and attack them. And because of this, they did not take the defense of their city seriously. Instead, they depended on those natural defenses to protect them and keep them safe. And there's a story about Sardis that, that one time there was a king, King Cyrus, and he wanted to defeat the city, and he offered a reward for any soldier who could figure out for him how to defeat Sardis. So one soldier went about watching the city and watching their defenses. And one day he saw a guard who dropped his helmet, and he saw him come out and walk down a secret hidden trail to go down and then back up the cliffs. Their enemies then, they, they took a small group of soldiers and they went up that trail. And when they came to the gate, hoping to overwhelm the defenders, they found that it was unlocked and open. It wasn't even guarded. You see this lack of vigilance, this, this lack of keeping watch. It led them to be conquered easily. Not once, but history says at least twice because they failed to keep a watch. You could almost say that, that they fell asleep at the gate when it came to their safety. And they really needed to wake up. And I'm going to say that this is the picture of, of how some Christians live today. We don't put a watch over the gates of our minds and our hearts. We, we let in negative and sinful influences. And, and they come into us without us ever thinking about how we're living. Is this... A show I should be watching? Is this a behavior I should be engaging in? Should, should I be dating this person? You see, Christians are supposed to be on guard about the things that we bring into our lives. So next, what we see in this letter is, is a picture of Jesus for the church. Jesus says, He who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars says this, Jesus is revealing himself here as the one who holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. This picture, it's a picture of Jesus as the master over every spiritual power and authority. In the Bible, the number seven is a number of completeness. It's the, the number of wholeness. And what we see is that Jesus is the one who holds the full spirit of God. And as I said, one way to see this sign is that Jesus is the one who has full authority over the spiritual world. But it's also an image of Jesus that he has the fullness of the Holy Spirit in himself. 
that he has a perfect relationship with the person of the Holy Spirit. We also see in this picture that, that Jesus is the one who has full spiritual authority over his church. All too often we see churches that, that forget this. The, the church was created by and it was created for Jesus. He's the head and, he, and, and it's Jesus who is supposed to have all authority and who's supposed to lead his church. The, the local leaders of any given church were simply supposed to serve him and were supposed to lead the church as Christ wills it. The personal preferences and the opinions of the congregation are not supposed to be what drives the church. The leaders are to strive to, to search and discern the will of Jesus through God's word, through, through prayer, and by dutifully following the pattern of the church that's set down in the New Testament. The leaders preach and teach the Word of God, and, and then it's the responsibility of the congregation to study that, to, to ensure that the leaders are in fact following God, and then to make sure that the ministry of the church remains biblical. Next, we see that, that Jesus reveals the problem of the church. He says, I know your deeds, that, that you have a name, that you are alive, but you are dead. Wake up. Wake up and strengthen the things that remain which were about to die, for I have not found your deeds completed in the sight of my God. Jesus knew the church at Sardis. He knew the people. And that they had a name, they, they had a reputation for being alive. If you looked at this church, it appeared to be active, vibrant. It was a good church. This was a church where, where buildings would have been kept up and everything would have looked nice. There were meetings and events happening all the time. The people gathered together, but it was dead. How can a church with so much activity be dead? Well, Jesus saw the church for what it really was. That, that all of that activity, all of that reputation is not a guarantee for true spiritual character and obedience to Jesus. One commentator said this about Sardis, that, that they are the perfect model of inoffensive Christianity. You see, there were no trials, there were no tribulations because they're dead. They didn't take the gospel out and, and they didn't challenge the culture that they lived in. It, it didn't challenge people to, to reject sin and to live a holy life. And there were no sig significant attacks against them because they did nothing to further the kingdom of God. This kind of church is no thre threat to Satan's domain, so it's not even worth attacking. The biblical commentator William Barclay said about Sardis that there was peace there, but it was the peace of the dead. And I wonder what this kind of church would look like today. And unfortunately, I don't need to look that hard. I look around and I think of these mega churches and pastors like Joel Osteen, Bill Johnson, Brian Houston, and Steve Furtick. I mean, they attract tens of thousands of people and they have these big buildings, lots of events, active online ministries, big successful praise bands, and people who are excited and energetic. But I see all too frequently in churches like this that they face scandals. And when I listen, I rarely hear the word, the word of God clearly preached, speaking out against sin and calling people back to repentance. But they seem alive. And they seem alive because in America, we count bodies, buildings, and bucks. I mean, what makes a church alive in America is if the buildings are huge and, and they have these, these complexes or, net, or church networks, that they have budgets of 50, 60, 70 million dollars a year. They have celebrity pastors with big houses and bigger bank accounts. And unfortunately in America, we've stopped judging success in the church as God does. By faithfulness, holiness, by love, holding the biblical doctrine and, and service to the kingdom. And I say, give me a church with 100 faithful followers instead of a church with 50,000 fans and just watch what the Holy Spirit's going to do. 
And Jesus also says to this church, I have not found your deeds completed in the sight of my God. These were people who were doing things. They had works. But what they were doing was not truly for God in the end. You see, a church can be filled with activity and none of it will glorify or please God if we don't have the right motives. So the church must be careful that everything we do be done for God and not for us. And Jesus challenged these people to wake up. Now remember, this is the city that they lived in that fell twice to enemy attack because they did not set a guard. So Jesus speaking this way would have spoke right into their culture. They needed to wake up and they needed to strengthen the things that remained. In the life of every church, there needs to be times when you stop. You look around and you assess what you are doing. You need to see if you're stuck in tradition, if if you're focused on pleasing people and not God, and then it's time to shake things up. And I'm going to tell you one of the things that I so appreciate about Mike Bartlett, our, our lead minister here, is that ever since Mike began ministry, he has constantly asked the difficult questions, and he has made the tough calls. And when it was necessary, he did what needed to happen to shake up the church and wake him up. And I believe that is the reason that God called Mike here, and I believe it's one of the reasons for the success of this church. So after telling the church the problem, Jesus goes on and tells them of the coming punishment of the church. He said, so remember what you have received and heard and keep it and repent. Therefore, if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief and you will not know at what hour I will come to you. Now, honestly, as as far as punishments go, it, it doesn't seem like that big of a deal. But we must remember the church, just like the city that was in, was apathetic about its own self defense. And just like the city, it's not going to be overwhelmed by a direct attack, but by quiet invasion. So the church was at risk. They fell asleep and and they failed to set a watch for themselves. So Jesus warns them that, that they must become watchful. They did not measure up to Jesus' standards. Their works were incomplete. They That means they performed duties, but not completely. They they began things, but not for the glory of God. So they didn't finish well. But this church in Sardis, they they probably did things and, and they kept them going, even though they didn't accomplish anything for the kingdom of God. Or or maybe they started great projects and then they just left them to die. And while those are problems, the actual root of the problem is not that they didn't finish. It's that they didn't finish because they had the wrong motives. They had the wrong heart. And that's another big part of what ministry is all about. It's knowing how to complete the task that you have. Is what you're doing glorifying God? And I need to let the people here at the Westport Christian Church know that your elders are constantly praying and talking about how to make sure the Westport Christian Church stays on track with God's will. They're vigilant in watching for what's called ministry drift. Those slow compromises with culture around us that will damage the church. But I want us to see what else Jesus says. He says that due to their apathy, that his return would come upon them like a thief. And what he means is that that when he comes back, that that, that great day of the Lord when Jesus returns and, and... proclaims judgment on all and and gathers his people. That this church was going to be completely unaware and they were going to be caught unprepared. Here's how Paul talks about this day in 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 2. He says, For you yourselves know full well that the day of the Lord will come just like a thief in the night. And Peter has this to say in 2 Peter 3, verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief in in which the heavens will pass away with a roar and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat and the earth and all of its works will be burned up. So this warning about that day coming like a thief is actually very serious. 
Because this is not just what it's going to be like for those who have rejected Jesus. But it's going to be the fate for all too many who have professed Christ. I mean, they're oblivious to their need to remain holy before God. They proclaim faith in Christ, but they fail to follow Him daily. They've not set a watch over their faith. And on the day of the Lord's return, they will be unprepared. So how do we fight this kind of apathy? What will we make sure that that we're grounded in Scripture? That our weekly worship is focused on God and His Word. That we engage in regular Bible study, both as a church and then individually. That we pray and that we seek God's will as found in His Word. And we complete the works that God has set before us. And then next we see what I'm calling a praise for the church. He says, But you have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their garments, and they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. Now some, some commentators say this is not really a praise. It's, it's an observation that there are a few believers in Sardis who had not yet defiled their faith through apathy and laziness and that they will get to walk with Jesus. But but I believe Jesus is sharing this information as a way to encourage the followers, those who are faithful, and it's also pointing the unfaithful back to Him and what He wants for them. These few people, they're not focused on living a life of luxury and indulgence. Instead, they have remained faithful to Jesus. These followers, these faithful few, they lived in a culture but they were not of that culture. And they, by the life that they live, provided a witness to the glory of Jesus by living out their faith daily. And I know it's hard, but it is possible to live in a culture that is focused on luxury and physical pleasure. A culture that that tells us We have to have a big house, a new car, the big screen TV, multiple vacation, more clothes than we could ever wear, and on and on and on of all of the things that make up the good life. And those things, we often get them with easy money. Money on credit that we don't even have. Going into debt just so we can have the good life. And we forget that all that we have It's from God, and we're supposed to use it to glorify Him, not so that we could be happy. Now, I want to say there's nothing wrong with having stuff. But when stuff becomes our focus instead of Jesus, we have a problem. Because at that point, we've soiled our garments, and we're no longer walking with Him in white. And Jesus ends with a promise for the church. He proclaims, he who overcomes will thus be clothed in white garments, and I will not erase his name from the book of life. And I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Jesus promises that for those who remain faithful, for those who overcome, for those who repent and return to him, that they will be clothed in white. This is a sign of of the purity and the righteousness of Jesus that we get to clothe ourselves in when we surrender our lives to him. These faithful will walk with him and, and their names will be known by him and they will be in the book of life. And Jesus will confess those names before God and his angels. This again shows us as a sign of of having a personal, full, and eternal relationship with Jesus. And imagine the day, the day that Jesus will stand before his Father and will proclaim your name to the Father and his angels. That day when you enter into his very presence. That is a promise that should help us to overcome the hardships, the trials, and the temptations that we face here. I want to take this as an opportunity to address something from this text. 
Because if the righteous will not have their names erased from the book of life, if, if those faithful to Christ will have their books remain in the book of life, what else does that mean? And the obvious answer is this, that the faithful will be counted among God's children, they're saved, but it also means that there are people whose names will be erased from the book of life who were previously in it. And that's the consequence of disobedience, of sin, of unrepentance. It's that people who proclaim Jesus once will be cast out because they've rejected him. And Jesus already said that there were going to be those who proclaimed him as Lord who would not enter into his kingdom. You find that in Matthew chapter 7, where he proclaims, every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So then you will know them by their fruits. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and and in your name cast out demons and in your name perform many miracles? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. To to those who overcome, who remain faithful and, and complete the works that Jesus has given them, This is encouraging as they have the assurance of the saving grace of God. But to others, to the fallen brother or sister, to to those who at one time surrendered their life to Christ, they have done good works, but their hearts have wandered from Jesus. This warning should make us pause and say, do I know if my name is in the book of life? You see, in Revelation, we read about this this day of judgment. Then I saw a great white throne and him who sat upon it from whose presence earth and heaven fled away and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, the great and the small standing before the throne and books were opened and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged from the things which were written in the books according to their deeds. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. That is Revelation chapter 20, verses 11 and 12 and verse 15. And while I think that the meaning of this is obvious, there are still many out there who teach that once you are saved, you are always saved. And I just got to say, but I, Part of the problem is I don't like the language of can you lose your salvation because that's not the right question. I can't lose my salvation like I lose my keys or my wallet by accident. No, the question is, can I reject the grace of God once I've received it? Can I reject salvation from Him? And I believe the clear biblical answer is yes. And to the people who were reading this letter or hearing it, Those who had a good understanding of the Old Testament, they knew exactly what Jesus was saying here. Remember what I said last week. The book of Revelation is best understood by first understanding the Old Testament. So let's look at a couple of Old Testament references about being blotted out of the book of life. In Exodus, we read this. But now if you will forgive their sin, and if not, please blot me out from your book which you have written. And the Lord said to Moses, whoever has sinned against me, I will blot him out of my book. And then out of Psalms, we read this. God says, may they be blotted out of the book of life and may they not be recorded with with the righteous. You see, it's important for us to realize that God's eternal character is that he does not change. In the Old Testament, he has revealed that there would be those who while once they were his, would have their names blotted out, erased from the book of life because of their disobedience, because of their sin, because of their rejection of him, because they're unrepentant. And what is true in the old is affirmed in the New Testament. And then as always, Jesus ended his letter 
with a call for those who have ears to hear. And again, I stand here today and I pray that we, the church, have had ears to hear. That we will both as individuals, but also as the body of believers ask, is my faith dead or almost dead? Do I need to wake up my faith? Do I need to truly surrender to Jesus today? I, I need to ask, am I more focused on my comfort in having my best life now because I think I've earned the things of this world? Or am I truly surrendered to Jesus, using what he has given to me to glorify him? Like I said before, I'm not saying it's a sin to have things. But it is a sin to let those things, that comfortable life, become an idol in your life. So my question today is this. What does a surrendered living faith look like? Am I all aboard with Jesus? Am I rooted and committed to him through a local body of believers? Do I submit all of my life to the Lordship of Christ or do I only do that on Sundays? And what will I do now going forward to live out my faith daily? Will I hold on to the promise to be able to walk with Jesus? Let's pray. Father God, I come before you and once again I, I thank you for you, for who you are. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, for your grace and your love and your majesty and your righteousness and your judgment. And Father, I ask that your word will, will affect each and every one of us, that we will have had ears to hear and, and we will desire to have a living, active faith for our good but so that we can go out into a lost, hurt, and broken world and share Jesus with everyone we meet so they too may be alive and walk with Jesus. It's in his name I pray, amen. Every week when we preach, we give an invitation. These sermons are, are to edify the church. It's to lift up the body of Christ but it's also to share the story of Jesus with those of you who have not yet met him, to see him for who he really is, that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God, God in the flesh, who died for your sins, who was buried and then rose from the dead to give you hope for eternal life. And that he has called you to surrender that life to him, to count the cost of following him, to die to yourself in the waters of, of baptism, to live for, for him in a transformed and faithful life. If you're hearing this message and it's time and you don't know what to do, please reach out to us. Call, text, email us. We're going to help you any way that we can. And if you're out there and you are hurting and confused and you need prayer, again, reach out to us and we will pray with you and we will pray for you. For your good, but again, so that we all see just how good God really is. We now come to the time in our worship where we, we assemble together and take communion. I hope you've gathered your emblems there at home that you can take it with us here in the end. Well, as I'm out in the field working, I'll often get a song stuck in my head that, that I just can't get out. And I'll sing it all the way through many times, thinking that if I change the ending just a little bit, I can hear the, the last shot of the drum or the last strum of the guitar, that, that it'll go away. But it usually doesn't. And... As I hum or, or sing these tunes, oftentimes I'll start thinking about the lyrics that I'm singing. One that I, I recently had stuck in my head was one I'm sure you're familiar with. It, it goes like this. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and he bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him 
and all my love is due him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing blood. Now, that is a song I've heard all of my life. And as I thought about what I was singing, I noticed it didn't say victory for Jesus. Rather, victory in Jesus. It it wasn't Jesus who needed a victory. After all, it, it wasn't Jesus who had a sin problem. It wasn't Jesus who was powerless against death. It wasn't Jesus who helplessly separated who was helplessly separated from god but god loved us so much that he gave his son to accomplish what we could not we couldn't conquer sin and death and we couldn't restore man's relationship with god we can however be victorious in jesus because the victory was for us When we come together for communion, we reflect on Christ's life and what it means to us as individuals as well as for the whole body. We look to his resurrection and see the the evidence that he was all he said he was. That, That he was able to save. That, that he is the way, the truth, and the life. That, that he is love. That, that he is the word and that he is the light. That, that he is the good shepherd, our, our king, our priest, our God, and our salvation. With communion, we recognize that victory was not free. It, it came with a price. Jesus willingly suffered unspeakable humiliation and pain on the cross. It cost a body broken and innocent blood to be poured out for the redemption of sins. We remember his his broken body with, with the bread. We remember his blood with the cup of juice. And by doing this, we proclaim his death and we claim victory in Jesus. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the many things, the the many things we couldn't imagine doing to to save us, to redeem us back to you. And Father, I, I am thankful that we get to claim victory in you. This this world simply simply put thinks it's winning the war. But you've already won. You've already claimed that victory that they cannot come close to. So, Father, I thank you for this time that we get to come together to remember these things and partake in this meal that you have prepared for us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. On the night Jesus was betrayed, he sat with his disciples. And after the meal, he he took the bread and and he broke it. He passed it among them and said, this represents my body that will be broken for you. Take and eat. And then he took the juice. He poured it. He he blessed it. He passed it among them and said, this is the blood that will be poured out for the forgiveness of sins and as a sign of the new covenant. Take and drink.
Once again, we've come to the end of our time together in worship, and I want to thank you for coming back, for being with us, for hearing the Word of God. And we here at the Westport Christian Church pray that this ministry is a blessing to you. May you be safe. May God watch over you. And we hope to see you next week. God bless. Goodbye. Say